When I started my PhD back in 2003, one of the first things my supervisor asked me to do was to write a literature review. And wanting to impress my new boss, I decided that I was going to write the best literature review the world had ever seen. I even thought that if it was good enough, I might be able to get it published, and what an amazing start that would have been. So I started reading and writing, but very quickly I got overwhelmed by the amount of material that was available, much of which I didn't really understand. So I didn't end up writing the best literature review the world had ever seen, and in fact, that particular review never even got finished. And this was an early knock to my confidence. It didn't crush me, but it just fed that little voice at the back of my head that said maybe I wasn't good enough. Now, much later, I did write a very good literature review, but it was only after figuring out how to work with the literature in a more efficient and effective way. So, in this video, I'd like to talk about why working with the literature is so stressful and also introduce you to some other ways of thinking about it. But before we get to that, if we haven't met before, my name's James Hayton. I'm a former physicist and since 2010, I've worked full-time coaching PhD students from all kinds of academic fields in academic writing, project management, and stress management skills. I also do talks and workshops at universities around the world, and I provide online courses over on my website at phd.academy. And I'm also author of this book. So if you'd like to know more about what I do, head to my website, which I'll link to in the description below. So why is the literature so hard to work with? Well, the most obvious reason is the sheer scale. So depending on your project, there might be tens of thousands of sources, maybe even hundreds of thousands or more, that are in some way related to what you do. And if there are, say, 10,000 papers, reading at a rate of 10 per day, every day, it will take you nearly three years to get through them all. And that's assuming you only read each one once, and it's not accounting for new work being published in that time. Because in a research area where there are already 10,000 papers, there are probably more than 10 new papers being published every single day. And then, of course, you have the fact that each source you read references many others, and if you try and follow up on those, then the reading list grows even faster. So, you might have to work with a lot of papers, but then each individual paper could also be a bit of a nightmare to read. Now, this might be because it's badly written, or it could simply be because academic papers are written for an expert audience, and they assume the reader has a lot of pre-existing knowledge. And a lot of students fall into the trap of taking notes and making summaries of papers treating the literature as if it were like an undergraduate course where you just have to absorb all of the information. But this doesn't really work because academic papers are not written to teach and you need a certain level of knowledge to be able to engage with them effectively. And the way that you gain that knowledge isn't by simply reading more papers because that just piles confusion on top of more confusion. So I'll talk a bit about how to start building that knowledge in a few minutes, but understand that even if you do have a really good level of foundational knowledge, some papers are just really difficult to understand. So even if you take a world-leading expert in your field, I can guarantee that there will be some papers that they have to take time to fully grasp. And there's really no way to shortcut this. Another reason why the literature is so difficult is that it exists on the very edge of knowledge. 
So in an undergraduate degree, generally speaking, you will have been dealing with well-established knowledge. So ideas that have been tested and refined and largely accepted by the field. And in most areas of study, this core of established knowledge doesn't change very fast. And you can just accept what your professors tell you. But when you look at the academic literature, each individual paper is working at that boundary between knowledge and doubt, or at least at the time of publication. So one paper in isolation usually isn't enough to prove something. And you might find different papers presenting really quite contradictory results or arguments. So you can't just read one paper and accept what it says as true. And to make this even more complicated, not all published research is any good. And you need to be able to judge the quality of the papers that you read and cite. So even though every published paper has to go through some form of peer review, the system is far from perfect. So different journals have different standards and some will accept almost anything. But even good journals can publish substandard work. So much depends on who reviews the paper. And occasionally, an overworked or underqualified referee will miss important mistakes. And then, of course, there's the issue of academic fraud, where some researchers manipulate or fake their results, which can be difficult to detect, especially if you're reading too fast. And just last week, I heard about allegations of data fixing against a high-profile researcher at Harvard. And there's a great video breakdown of this by Pete Judo, which I'll link to up here. Now, what this kind of case highlights to me is the importance of reading and understanding every paper you cite, and certainly anything that you use as the basis of your own work. Because from what I know of that particular case, the effect sizes being reported really should have raised some red flags much sooner, but a lot of people were citing the work because they were kind of excited about it. So just because a paper is published, that doesn't mean the research is any good. So finally, we have the psychological factor. So most people who end up doing PhDs have done well throughout their whole education. And for many of us, doing well in education became a hardwired part of our identity because it was rewarded from such a young age. So when you start a PhD and you're faced with the tangled mess of literature, it might be the first time you've really struggled academically and the natural temptation might be to work harder read more, take more notes, basically to do more of the kinds of things that got you through your education up to this point. But when that doesn't work, it can have quite a profound effect on your confidence and self-esteem, especially when combined with all the other stresses of PhD life. But if you're struggling with literature, it's not a reflection of your intelligence or your ability or your worth. You're most likely struggling because, as I've said elsewhere, the skills that got you into a PhD are not the same skills you need to complete one. And the way you've approached studying in the past won't work when applied to academic literature. So what can we do differently? Before I answer, it's important to point out that there is some important nuance here, and your approach to the literature should be different depending on the stage that you're at, so depending on your level of knowledge and also on what you're trying to achieve. For example, if you're already very familiar with the literature and you just want to keep up with the latest developments, that requires a different approach 
to when you're first starting. Or if you're writing a literature review, that requires a different approach to searching the literature for a solution to a specific problem to help in your research. So the first thing is knowing what you're trying to achieve right now. Then it's about selecting the best sources to help you achieve your immediate goal. And this idea of selection is crucial. So because your brain has limited bandwidth, instead of trying to read as much as possible, we want to identify a small number of sources that are most useful to you right now. Now, a lot of papers just won't be relevant, but then there will also be a lot of papers that may be in some way relevant to your work, but aren't helpful to you in this particular moment, either because of the current immediate goal, or maybe because you're just not ready for them yet. And it's okay to put these to one side and come back to them another time. You don't have to read everything right now. So I'd like to give just one example here of how you might select papers based on a specific immediate goal. So let's say you're starting out in a new field and you don't really know any of the literature. If you just download a stack of recent papers, you'll get lost very quickly. So we need to identify a small number of sources that are most useful to help you get started. And when you're selecting papers, it's important to understand that most research is incremental. Now, collectively, that incremental work is important, but the vast majority of individual papers have very little impact on their own. But occasionally, there are papers that make major new discoveries or propose new theories or um, invent new techniques that change the way that others in the field think about or conduct their research. And if you understand even just a few of these groundbreaking, paradigm-shifting papers, if you can understand what problem they solved or um, what they did that was so innovative or what discovery was so surprising or um, what technical challenge they overcame and why it was important, that gives you a foundation for understanding the incremental work that followed. However, those groundbreaking papers, even though they're relatively easy to identify, they might be quite difficult to read. Because again, they may assume a lot of prior knowledge, or they might not be very clearly written. Reading them again might help, but not if something's just not explained. And in that case, what we can do is we can look for other sources that explain the groundbreaking work a bit more clearly. These sources could be textbooks, they could be review articles, or even Wikipedia articles or YouTube videos in some cases. Or you can just ask people to explain the idea. Now, obviously, you wouldn't cite Wikipedia or YouTube or a conversation in your writing. But if the goal is to build your knowledge, then you can use whatever sources are most helpful to you right now. And then you can go back to the original paper, read them again with a bit more understanding. Now, once you've got that foundation, you can start to look at the trends in the literature. So the kinds of problems that people are working on and the open questions being debated. And then you can start to look at specifics, really diving into the details of some of that incremental work. Although, of course, you'll probably go back again to the groundbreaking work many times. This isn't a strict sequence where you do one thing, then the next, then the next. You'll constantly be going back and forth between some of the fundamentals, then the more advanced work, the cutting edge work, old groundbreaking work. It's, it's a constant process of going back and forth. So what about writing about the literature? 
Now, this is quite a big topic, so I don't want to cover it in too much depth here. But there's a common assumption that writing a literature review helps you to develop your expertise. That might be true in some cases, but I don't think it's necessarily the best way to go about it. So coming back to what I said at the start about my literature review that I tried to write in the first year of my PhD, I think one of the big problems, other than my wild overambition to write the best literature review the world has ever seen, one of the big problems was that I was trying to write about the literature before I understood it, putting too much pressure on showing knowledge before developing it. And I was able to write a very good literature review at the end of my PhD, but that was when I had the knowledge to base it on and having the understanding of the sources I was citing. But this understanding didn't just come from reading. I also had a lot of practical experience in the lab using the kinds of techniques that I was reading about in the literature. So the literature helped some of my practical work, but the practical work also helped me understand the literature. For example, by my third year, I could quite quickly spot mistakes in some papers in the um, interpretation of data, for example, because I'd done that kind of analysis and made a lot of those kind of mistakes myself. The other crucial factor that helped build my knowledge of the literature was that I was constantly talking to other people in my research group. So I heard about their work and I heard about other things that were a little outside my immediate area of focus that I probably wouldn't have learned about just by reading. And this gave extra breadth to my knowledge that fed into my writing. So in this video, I've just tried to give an introduction to a different way of thinking about the literature, but obviously there's a lot more to it and it's quite a big topic. So if you'd like to know more, or if you have any questions about anything I've explained here, or if anything I've said just doesn't make sense to you, please do leave a comment below. And if you like this video, please hit like and subscribe as it helps other people to find it and it helps me grow this channel. But also, please head to my website at phd.academy and sign up for email updates so I can let you know when I publish new videos because YouTube won't always show you the latest videos, even if you're subscribed. You'll also find on my website details of my online writing course and also my book, as well as one-to-one -one coaching and live training at universities. So that's all from me. Thank you so much for watching till the end and I'll see you next time.